All right, terrific. Uh, we're going to zoom along. Most of the information in my talk is going to be in the handouts. There's a lot of information there. For the purpose of the talk, I'm going to kind of go over the big general points so that we don't get mired down in, in the details. Well, I was watching that with my daughter the other day. I said, boy, what a perfect opening slide for this talk. American culture has been fascinated by the bionic man for years and the bionic woman. And, uh, and I thought it would be a great, it provided with a lot of great little kitschy lines, but really serves to uh, pro provide a really important springboard for some of the questions that are raised by ventricular assist device therapy. Uh, one is, who should we rebuild? In other words, which patients are candidates for this therapy? How should we rebuild? Which tools or devices should we use? What can we expect? What are the results? Will the patient be happy? In other words, what will their quality of life be? And can we pay for this? What about the cost effectiveness of this therapy? Uh, in terms of disclosure, I would like to say that I get research funding and speak on behalf of Abiomed. Uh, I don't believe that's going to provide any significant conflict of interest since I won't be discussing any of their devices. And I wish I had other conflicts of interest, but I don't. <laughs> All right. In any event, uh, the basic outline of the talk is going to be in three sections. I want to talk a little bit about heart failure, some of the demographics that we're all familiar with. Then we're going to move on for what are the options for the worst of the heart failure patients, the end-stage cardiomyopathy patients. And finally, really going to focus in on the ventricular assist devices because this is really going to be in the coming years the treatment of choice for this group of patients for a number of reasons, and I'll go into them. So starting off with heart failure. The epidemic of heart failure has been widely reported. We all know that. A bunch of factors are, provide for this. One is that we're doing better and better with keeping these patients alive with medical therapy. Uh, we're also using ICDs, biventricular pacers, that are keeping these patients alive longer and longer. The downside of that is in a kind of obscure way, that we, this is an epidemic for which we are partially to blame. These patients are living longer and longer. These patients are developing advanced heart failure in later stages of life. And the conventional treatment for these patients would be heart transplantation, but because they're all elderly, they're no longer candidates. And so we create a, a major problem for us in an epidemiological perspective. Uh, as far as the heart failure facts, these are modest estimates. These are relatively old from uh, the American Heart Association from about six years ago, and the numbers have been going up. Prevalence is about five million. We get about a half a million new cases of heart failure each year. Now, within that spectrum of heart failure, overall, the expected five-year survival is less than five years. But for the group of patients that we're talking about today, the expected lifespan is less than one year. And that's why this therapy is so important. Uh, we know, very importantly, that heart failure is a direct consequence of advancing age. And in fact, in patients who are above 65 years of age, over 10% of patients develop significant heart failure. I drew this red bar because this is the usual cutoff we use for transplant. So you can see what the implications of this are. The patient population over 65 will double in the next 20 years. As you know, we have a variety of classification schemes for heart failure. We're all used to the NYHA scheme, which really categorizes the patient as to what their symptoms are today. 
uh, the staging system is a more recent invention, and what it does is it tries to categorize patients in a system akin to cancer treatment and renal failure, where we patients move from A to B to C to D, and almost never backwards. Patients we're going to talk about today have stage D heart failure. We talk about escalating therapy for heart failure. At the bottom left-hand corner are, is the therapy for patients at the beginning stages of heart failure. Here's the asymptomatic group, perhaps hypertensive or familial tendencies where we may start on ACE, ARBs, move on to beta blockers and up the escalator until we get to the end stage heart failure patients with refractory heart failure who really the bottom line is they can either get transplanted or vatted or neither. Here's just a comparison for different patient populations to put it in perspective. So back when, when I was training in medical school, uh, the uh, AIDS epidemic was first starting and uh, the mortality rate was much higher. But now most age patients have an expected one year survival in excess of 90%. Leukemia patients in excess of 60%. Lung cancer excess of 40 Pancreatic cancer still down around 20% on a par with this group of heart failure patients, end stage heart failure. So this is a very serious disease, it's a lethal disease. Let's move on for the options for these patients. The treatment of choice for patients with advanced heart failure who are appropriate candidates is heart transplantation. The results with heart transplantation are stellar. Uh, we have 85% one year survival and 70% five year survival as compared to OMM, optimal medical therapy, or optimal medical management. In the group of patients that we're talking about today, one year survival is about 25% and less than 10% at two years. Uh, the challenge, unfortunately, is the donor heart availability. In this country, we've been doing only about 2,200 heart transplants per year for the last 10 years, and it ain't gonna get any larger. Here is a survival curve for heart transplantation. We talk about the half-life of a heart transplant. In other words, at what period of time are half the patients still alive? And that's 10 years for heart transplantation. As you can see, there's an early drop-off. A lot of the mortality for heart transplantation occurs in the perioperative period. And after the first month or so, there's a steady drop-off so that uh, after six months, about 3.5% of patients die per year. And it's a steady one throughout. Uh, this is the number of heart transplants done worldwide. And you can see after 1995 that the uh, numbers have dropped and plateaued. So that we're doing in the worldwide about 3,300 a year. The United States does about two thirds of the world's transplants. So we have a severe organ shortage. Uh, I saw this cartoon of a heart transplant unit and it said, picked one you like yet. And I thought, boy, whoever drew this is seriously misinformed. You know, more, more likely the situation, at least most of, for our recipient list, is this. You know, you wait till you get what you get, okay? And it's created a big problem because we're having an ever-growing list and not enough hearts to give them. However, the one bright side is we do have things to offer them, and that's these assist devices that really have come into play. They, they first came upon the scene as bridge to transplant devices to keep the patients alive and are now being examined and utilized more frequently for destination therapy, a therapy in and of itself for the life of the patient. So in all, heart transplantation, we say, is a scarce resource. It is medically revolutionary, but epidemiologically trivial. The impact on our total population of heart failure patients is trivial. If you took a, talk about all the patients that could possibly benefit for a heart, from a heart transplant, only 2% of those will get a heart transplant. Well, what is happening to these patients? Well, you can see by this cartoon, they're dying. They're dying at different periods of time. We haven't gotten very good at, at estimating when they're going to die. There's a whole bunch of different schemes that we use. But you can be sure they're going to die eventually, and they're going to die sooner rather than later. We can categorize them as different categories of patient. At the top of this list are the worst patients. At the bottom are increasingly improved prognoses. So someone who presents in shock after an acute MI, death is imminent unless something is done. Chronic heart failure, but now with renal failure, liver failure, they have about a one month average mortality. Class four heart failure patients that are requiring IV inotropes, three to six months. Class four who can't tolerate ACEs, their blood pressure drops too low or have other side effects, six month survival. 
Then you have the class four who are on ACEs, but they have these other factors. And you can see from here on down, we grade these patients. Most of the patients in the early days of VADS were in these two top categories. They've now been expanded, and we're now dropping down for the destination therapy patients to down to the class four ACE intolerant and even more benign. As the results with VAD therapy are getting better and better, they're being introduced to an earlier and earlier class of patients because one thing we know is the better you are going into an assist device, uh, the better your outcomes are going to be. Uh, one other thing that we've noted say, from comparison from 2000 to 2006 is these are the patients who are listed for transplant. Those who are on inotropes at a time of transplant were 34% in 2000. It's up to 41% in 2006, and it's now close to 50%. VADS, 15% in 2000, 30% in 2006, and now over 40%. Pretty soon, half of our transplants are going to have VADS in previously. The one nice thing about the VADs, among many things, is that many of these patients who used to have to be hospitalized waiting for a transplant can now go home. And you can be a status one at home.